and 70 central region 1362 and then the eastern region with 1244 now let's go over here still on the ghana health service website and get a better understanding of how these 700 over 700 cases you know were recorded and it says a total of 782 new cases were reported on july 26th 2020 and these are samples that were taken from the period of 23rd june to 25th of july 2020 so when you look at this figure it shows you you know the days the the, the samples were taken or the dates the samples were taken and also the number of samples that were taken and from this particular figure you can see that from the 17th to the 19th of july we had the highest number of samples being taken and that is over 120 samples but on days like the 27th of june 1st of july and in between 11 july to 13th july uh, no samples were taken between that particular period or no tests were done between that period and so that is it for the new cases that have been recorded now let's come up here and see if more discharges are being made on this particular table and with the greater Accra region with 17,811 cases 15,284 out of that number have been discharged and so the greater Accra region still has the highest number of active cases that is 2,459 given the region 85.8 recovery rates. Now let's go to the Ashanti region, which has the second highest number of cases with 8,548 discharges at 8,001. And so the region has 93.6% recovery rate, very close to 100% and active cases at 480. Also, let's take a look at the, uh, the Western region where 2,570 cases have been recorded and out of that, 2,346 have been discharged. And so the Western region has 222 active cases that are still being managed in the various isolation centers and also some at home. And so the region has 91.3% recovery rate. And so this is how, our, our, you know, discharges is looking like basically, uh, as always, the Ghana Health Service keep adding different chats to it but my concern is we're not seeing the chats that has to do with the deaths and also uh, you know the various regions and the number of deaths that have been recorded in you know whether the greater Accra region the Ashanti region because initially we're having that particular chat on the Ghana Health Service website but it looks like that particular one has been taken off and so now we just get the figure as in okay 168 deaths have been recorded so far but we do not know if they had any underlying health conditions and which conditions you know they had and also which regions the deaths are being recorded from so um that is my concern basically because that was also helping us to know which regions are recording the highest number of deaths and which particular you know underlying conditions these people who even had the infection of COVID-19 also passed on from so uh, if the Ghana Health Service can let us have that information back I think it, it will be very important as well but right about now let me hand over to Berla Mundi uh, to continue with some conversations. Definitely. And you've given me a question to ask Dr. Okoboy when he comes about, you know, the period, um, you know, from 23rd June up until mm -hmm. 20, what, uh, 3rd of July, July, right? Yeah. That's the samples that yes. have been tested. And we were asking earlier if these reagents will be used to test old samples because per the discharge protocols, of course, uh, we know that after, what, 10, 14 days, you are less likely to pass on the virus yeah. you could be discharged. So why are we still testing these people who probably have recovered? Already, we'll <laughs> ask that question. But um, joining us on the phone this morning to talk about the possible security threat of COVID-19 and what it means after we have phased out some protocols uh, that were put in place. Professor Emmanuel Kwesi Enin is the Director, Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. And uh, we'll be talking about all this and more. Good morning, sir. Hello. Hello. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us on COVID-19 360. Well, it's a great pleasure. <laughs> and, um, well, I hope you're doing well. First question I would want to ask you, even though we're talking security at this point, basically, what is your assessment of COVID-19 management here in Ghana? Well, I mean, I cannot speak about the health side. Yes. Um, but all I can say is that, I mean, in terms of, you know, the public response, public education, mm. Um, I think over time, we are beginning to see a certain improved awareness. So precisely because this 
it's an unseen challenge, an unseen enemy. And we don't see people having COVID and dying in terms of the way their physical appearance looks like. It's been fairly difficult for people to to grasp mm. the seriousness of the problem. But I think over time, uh, as I travel around Ghana, you see many more people using face masks. The social distancing or physical distancing is still a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we need to couch the public education in a language and a manner that appeals to multiple segments of our population. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, the first couple of months, uh, messaging was a little too abstract, a little elitist. Mm. Uh, people just thought, look, this is an Accra, Kumasi, urban area business and not mine. But as the public education information uh, continues, people are beginning to change their attitudes. But we need to, we need to continue. Absolutely, we need to continue. And uh, well, now let's narrow it down to the issue of it being a security threat because that was the notion out there at the beginning of the pandemic, the first time that we recorded in Ghana on the 12th of March. We're made to believe that it could cause some security problems. And as a result, borders were closed. Uh, we had security personnel dispatched out there to ensure that people adhere to the lockdown protocols, people were wearing their nose masks and all of that. There's been a phase in, uh, you know, a phased ease, easing of restrictions across board in the country. And so one will wonder, is it no more a national security threat? No, I think it is not just a national security threat. It is an existential threat. Mm. Um, the initial marshalling of security forces uh, onto the streets of Ghana uh, were basically to help people adhere to the protocols. I think it was very difficult, as we discussed earlier, for people to grasp in terms of their daily activities. Mm. But what is this monster that we are talking about? Yeah. Let's not forget that for the security services themselves, no security service on earth has been trained to deal with, with this thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so for us, the put up a very brave face to tell us to physically distance and to wear a nose mask and, you know, to wash our hands. They themselves were struggling to deal with this themselves because there were no protocols around it. You know, so this was an important, by a high-risk national assessment, mm. you know, that needed two strategies. One, cooperation from the general public mm -hmm. and from and from among them themselves as a unified institution, and then adherence. Let's not forget that, you know, this is about a state yeah. issuing instructions for a lockdown. Citizens, citizen-state relations over time have been very contentious. Mm. You know, so the role of the uniformed forces was simply to say, guys, look, this is what you need to do. Yeah. And that is why I think both the armed forces and the Ghana Police Service and all the sister institutions have done very well under these extremely difficult circumstances. Let's not forget, we also competing demands on their time. Mm -hmm. And in that time, we will talk about the borders and yeah. extremism. Absolutely. You know, so there were all these competing demands. They had to do their routine jobs you know, catching criminals, cyber criminals, people who are jumping over red lights, you know, but at the same time saying that, look, there's this unseen enemy. You've got to distance, you've got to stay in your house, mm -hmm. someone will try to get you some food, you know, and it is this ability to negotiate these competing demands that I will argue that particularly the Ghana Police Service, mm -hmm. Customs, Immigration, backed by the armed forces, you know, have done a human man's job. Okay. You know, when when the original instructions came, the, mm -hmm. the presidential directive, yeah. the Ghana Police Service's first response was that this is a humanitarian operation. We are not out, going out there to brutalize, to intimidate, to mm -hmm. threaten, although there were quite a few disturbing cases. Yeah. You know, uh, 
but that was as a result of two things. First, the individual fear of the officer of contracting the disease. But secondly, also, the lack of appropriate skill sets of becoming the provider of humanitarian aid, an mm. educator, a comforter, um, a guide. You know, so all these demands, yeah. of course, resulted in some officers losing their temper mm -hmm. uh, and then behaving in ways that we could have done without. You know, but we should also recognize the abuse, the okay. attacks, the okay. intimidation, yeah. and there were way too many people having exemptions. Mm. Everybody was like, suddenly a big man or a big woman but who had an exemption and had to go back biking to somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And of course, to so be generated frustration. Mm -hmm. If we are getting a dangerous machine under control, who is the one issuing all these exemptions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So knowing how institutions where they have stood their grounds, mm -hmm. some of them have been punished before, then they have to let people go. Yeah. You know, but overall, overall, I think particularly the Ghana Police Service um, has, has done a human's job. Okay. And my hope and prayer is that they will take the lessons of their public engagement because of COVID-19 and use it to change some of their operational uh, methodologies. All right. We'll come to the issue of security personnel and how they have even conducted themselves quite recently during the compilation of voters' register. But let's now talk about the border closure and the fact that there are quite a number of stranded Ghanaians who are crying for help, saying that they cannot afford the quarantine fees. Some may not even be able to afford to buy a ticket and, you know, pay for quarantine as well. And they've been refused entry into the country. I mean, really, if we're easing some of these restrictions to the extent that we even have people uh, totally ignoring the social distancing protocols in public transport, can we not open the borders for people to come home? Could that be a security threat if they should come in? Well, I think the closure of the borders from where I sit mm -hmm. It's a much bigger issue than just opening it for Ghanaians to come in. Okay. I don't know from customs and immigration how many tens of thousands of passengers use the Kutika airport on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, not talking about all our land and sea borders. Mm. Now, we also know that in almost every country where the lockdown protocols were, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, what? Were, Implemented were or lifted. lifted? Okay, lifted. We are seeing an increase. Mm. Now, knowing the resource constraints that we face, I think it makes a lot of practical and operational sense. Mm to keep the borders closed for some time. Let's not forget that it's also costing us massively economically. You know, but on balance, allowing X number of thousands, tens of thousands of people to cross the border into, into the country on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. I think we'll also have a certain percentage of those who are entering either being positive already yeah. and then coming to worsen the community spread. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the challenges and the weaknesses of getting these stranded Ghanaians to come home? You know, part of the problem is that where the government to say, look, we are going to bond you, sign this document, yeah. and then we will bring you home and you will pay. Mm -hmm. I can assure you the levels of compliance will be very low. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there is a history to all this. Um, but over time, we will need to find a way of bringing people back home. Because their visas would have expired. That means they will never be able to go back probably for five years. Mm -hmm. uh, people went for medical treatment. People went to school. Uh, so there are 
there are considerable humanitarian reasons yeah. uh, to consider bringing people back home. Okay. And I think extended family friends should probably help. I think the burden on government in responding to the challenges, the unintended challenges of oh. this unexpected COVID-19. Okay. Um, all right. uh, probably if we can help reduce that burden by a friends, family, acquaintances, helping to pay to bring people All right. that could also be useful. All right. Frog, let, let's talk about fake news and misinformation and how that also poses as a threat. Yesterday, there was a video that went viral of a doctor from Texas who was indicating that she had a cure for COVID-19, which was a drug that we've all known, um, you know, but of course was rejected by some health professionals as not the cure for COVID-19. And eventually, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram put out a statement saying that they were going to take down those videos. And indeed, they did. However, it's still circulating on WhatsApp, especially here in Ghana. Is this not the time for government to step in as they are fighting against fake news to clamp down on these videos? And if that's the case, what is your assessment of what has happened so far and what governments can do to further strengthen its fight against misinformation? Well, I think there are a couple of uh, good points in your question mm. um, about the potential impact of fake information or fake news on social destabilization. Now, if you remember, since the inception of the lockdown, mm. even in Ghana, we have had a lot of fake news uh, videos circulating around police brutality, military brutality. Yeah. And some of these were as old as four, five years. And you wonder, what was the essence of someone deliberately going out there to look for an old video and to place it in the public domain at a time when people feel insecure, mm. people feel afraid, and people are uncertain as to the person that they've just said hello to, the extent to that person might infect them. Yeah. Now, the subject I had argued very strongly that there was a need for us to establish a special desk that scans the websites and you know whatever. Mm -hmm. where people could very quickly report incidences of fake videos and fake news so we can get a robust mm. actual representation of the news. Now, in this video that is circulating now, it's, I mean, there have been multiple um, bits of information that shows yeah. that probably we shouldn't place much emphasis on this video. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it's circulating and there is no response of some sort from those who know, yeah. uh, it's what for me worries me and not about the video itself. Okay. Because since the beginning of first time immemorial, the use of false information, fake news, which earlier on, you know, when I was a young man was called propaganda. Mm. You know, has always been a normal aspect of political stroke security life. Yeah. Okay, so we as the state must know how to respond in a timely, rigorous, mm. and factual manner. Okay. So after the good they will keep circulating. Mm -hmm. The question is, what is our response mechanism? Yeah. How fast can we be able to respond? Absolutely. Um, so I think this failure is more from our side than the ability of the video itself to circulate, partially mm. because people are desperate for a cure. And if somebody out there wants the lyrical about having this cure, then people would want to, you know, send it around. So exactly. I hope by this interview and this conversation that you were having with different people, probably by the close of the day, there will be some response of sort. But I think we need a response. A Absolutely. Response. 
Absolutely. Uh, Professor Kwesienin, thank you so much for speaking to us. This is all time will allow, unfortunately. But we hope we can connect with you another time to speak about other issues concerning security threats in the country. And Professor Emmanuel Kwesienin is the Director of Faculty uh, uh, of Academic Affairs and Research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. And we'll go into details with this particular issue concerning the video that was put out by the supposed doctor in Texas with our Deputy Minister of Health, Dr. Okoboy, who joins us right after this. Welcome back. You're still watching COVID-19 360. We're live on TV3 Ghana and we're streaming live on Facebook as well. Don't forget our WhatsApp number is active. And so do send in your messages as well. Now let's zoom into what is happening on the continent down here in Africa. And we have 874,182 confirmed cases with deaths at 18,501. Recoveries at 524,091. And for healthcare workers who have been affected, we have 18,048. Now, let's start off with South Africa, as always. They're leading in Africa with 459,761. And in South Africa, 2.8 million tests have been conducted so far. And in the past 24 hours, 28,433 tests have been done so far. And so that should definitely tell you that more tests being conducted in South Africa. It means more infections will be recorded. Now, let's go to Egypt, where 92,947 cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed and in the past 24 hours 465 daily infections have been recorded and this is the 20th consecutive day that Egypt has recorded below 1,000 cases and that should tell you that uh, that is some good news for Egypt if you ask me because initially they were recording over 1,000 and even in the 2000s and so that is pretty good. Now let's go to Nigeria which is the third highest in Africa with 41,000 804 and in Nigeria 267,842 samples have been tested so far and according to experts that is quite low as Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa and so more samples are expected to be tested especially looking at how uh, you know infections are increasing in Nigeria and also across the continent and then down here in Ghana we have 34,406 confirmed cases and as of the last updates, over 700 cases have been uh, recorded so far, giving us you know, more cases down here. And then finally, Algeria with 28,615. And yesterday, I mentioned that Algeria and some of their provinces, uh, that is over 29 provinces, they are easing the restrictions on lockdown and you know, movement as well. And so as time progresses, definitely, they will be doing more of that. So now let's look at the recoveries where South Africa is still leading in that parameter with 287,313. Egypt, 35,959. And these are some of the countries on the continent that have the highest recovery rate. And Ghana is one of them, uh, you know, placing third with 29,801 recoveries. Algeria, 19,233. Nigeria with 18,764. And then Morocco with 17,066. So on the continent, we're not doing too bad at all when it comes to uh, recoveries. But uh, let's move on to the deaths as well, where we have 18,503 people who have unfortunately passed on due to COVID-19. And per country, South Africa is leading with 7,257 deaths. And just in 24 hours, uh, they've recorded a little over 200 deaths, you know, in just 24 hours due to COVID-19. And South Africa, uh, like we, we've seen the past couple of weeks, is the hardest hit on the African continent when it comes to COVID-19. Now, let's move on to Egypt, which is the second suspect is always, always, you know, following closely uh, after South Africa with 4,691 deaths. Algeria, 1,174. Nigeria with 868 deaths. And then Sudan with 725 deaths so far. So this is what uh, you know, when it comes to COVID-19, our case count and management is looking like on the African continent. But right about now, Bella is standing by with the Deputy Minister of Health, Dr. Okoboy. They are talking everything that has to do with COVID-19 down here in Ghana. And this is a conversation you definitely would want to listen to and send in your messages as well. So, Bella, over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for those statistics. And yes, Dr. Okoboy has joined us on COVID-19 360. If you have any questions at all, you know what to do. Find us on social media at TV3Ghana with the hashtag COVID19360. And of course, we're also on DSTV channel 279. Doc, good morning.
Thank you for joining us. How are you? I can imagine how stressed out you may be because of COVID-19 and the fact that you have to move around and, you know, ensure that safety is adhered yeah. to. So what I want to ask, first of all, we've recorded 782 new cases um, as of yesterday or as of this morning. Now, it says that these samples were taken from the 23rd of June to the 25th of July 2020. We ran out of reagents some time back. I remember we spoke to, um, you know, one of the... Uh, lab technicians in the Western region, and he said there were samples that had been piled up because there were no reagents. Moving forward, we eventually got these test kits and they came in. But we wanted to find out, because we ran out, and of course there were samples that had sat for about three to five weeks, and we all know that the discharge protocol says that after 14 days, you're less likely to pass on the virus because you could be discharged um, or could have recovered. Are we using these reagents to test the samples that have probably lasted five weeks or more? Or do we think that it's a waste of, you know, uh, product? And so maybe we should wait and start testing new samples that have been taken. Yeah, so, um, Bella, let me, let me say that, um, first of all, it's important to mention that the testing uh -huh. for those that have been there for more than two weeks. In fact, let me start with the total number of tests. Okay. We've done over... 382,000 tests mm -hmm. is one of the uh, most um, one of the impressive re testing regimes on the continent. Um, I saw your sister mm -hmm. mentioning the absolute number of tests done in the country, but that doesn't really tell you the picture, the, the real picture. Mm -hmm. What is done is to divide it per million of the population. Okay. So that it tells you how many tests are done for every one million of the population. That one is a standard, standardized one. Because 12,000 tests in Nigeria will not mean the same 12,000 tests in Kenya mm, yeah. because of the numbers. Mm. So if you do, do per million, Nigeria is doing about 1,200 tests. In fact, Nigeria is doing the same number of tests with um, um, Egypt, okay. about 1,000, 2,300 tests. Kenya is doing about 5,000 tests mm. per million. Mm -hmm. Ghana and India are doing around 12,000 per million. Per million. Okay. So Ghana is doing close to 10 times what Nigeria is doing mm -hmm. per million. What it means is that Ghana's COVID picture is 10 times more real than Nigeria's. Is that what it really means? Yeah, I'm, 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 yes, I'm about to explain to okay. you. Okay. Now, if I am testing 10,000 people for every 1 million of my population, and you are testing 100, mm -hmm. your COVID picture is less than my, my picture is more vivid because okay. i'm testing more okay and the way it is is that the more tests you do the more real the picture south africa is testing now about forty thousand per million mm -hmm. close to two three times ghana's testing regime what it means is that south Afri africa's picture is likely to be maybe twice as real okay so when people say that south africa is leading in terms of the contribution of the cases really if you go into the details you should not be too surprised mm -hmm. if they are testing 40,000 for a million. a million. Angola mm -hmm. is doing around 500. Nigeria was doing less than 1,000. Just recently, they went to go to 1,000. Mm -hmm. So, although Nigeria has 41,000 cases, it tells you that should they even test like Ghana, they can cross mm -hmm. 200,000. Yeah. So, really, you have to appreciate these dynamics also. Because there are countries who decide quietly that will not test. Okay. So, so as a strategy, they can be doing, let's say, 1,000 tests per million. And the picture they give you will be impressive. Mm. Even when they have the capacity to increase their testing capacity. Okay. So if th these are some of the dynamics. And you need this foundation to appreciate the fact that some countries are testing, mm. like giving us more numbers. Because they have decided as a matter of policy to test more. And here is the catch. Countries that are testing well, when you check their mortality rates, it's lower. Mm -hmm. Because the more tests, when you divide by the deaths, you get a lower rate. A lower rate. Okay. But those who are not testing enough, they will tell you, oh, our cases are few. But when you check as a percentage of the death as a percentage of their cases, mm -hmm. you see their mortality is raised. So it, Nigeria has a mortality of 2.2%. Mm -hmm. Should it test two, three times, it can drop. It can drop. Okay. Because South Africa is testing adequately, their mortality is 1.4. Yeah. Also, quite okay, compared to Canada, 8%. Mm. The US is 4%. US was doing 6 7%. Until now, they okay. increase the testing. Yeah. So these are some fundamentals which are very important. Okay. Now, back to the test. What we'll do is that we are not discounting 
all the samples. Remember, Noguchi is a research institution. Uh -huh. So these samples can be used for studies. But we normally prioritize. So if you have a case at Kolebu who has chest symptoms uh -huh. and has a sample at Noguchi for every four weeks, it is worth testing that sample. Okay. Although technically, you would have crossed the two weeks recovery period. You need it for the clinical management so that we will stop wearing people coveralls to go and treat that patient. Mm. So there are some cases that, as a matter of necessity, even once the person is alive, we assume it's not COVID, but doctors will say you need it to rule out. Okay. Ruling out because you have a checklist. Someone is coughing. One, you are thinking pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Two, COVID. Three, pulmonary cancer. Four, allergy. Five. So you need results to, to cancel some. So this okay. person is still sick. You are more convinced that, well, then if it's too weeks, let me see. Mm -hmm. The sample counts, it says that it's COVID positive. Okay. Then you know that all this while, this is uh, COVID. And by the way, anyone who is a suspected COVID normally is managed as if it's COVID. That's the protocol. Okay. So that you don't get surprises. But what about those who do not showcase any symptoms whilst yeah. you have taken the samples? Because you're doing contact tracing good, as well. Good. What happens to those? Because we've been made to understand that asymptomatic patients as well yeah. could possibly yeah. even be more infectious. That is disputable, by the way. Yeah. But of course, we're waiting for the health experts to really give us a, a solid uh, view of that particular discussion. See. But how do we then explain this? Bella, you don't need health experts. What do we need? Don't worry. The, <laughs> um, when I say you don't need health, health experts, what I mean is that you don't need a conference of epidemiologists and virologists mm -hmm. to speak to this. Um, my public health background is sufficient. Mm -hmm. to let you know what is happening. Okay. Now, first of all, the studies showed us in the beginning that people who have tested positive for COVID today can still have a positive test even three months down the line. Mm -hmm. Although they are fine. And so, the question scientists ask themselves is that when the person tests positive three months, although they look well, does it mean they have the virus and can infect? Mm -hmm. Or is something that is happening? So, another group of scientists did this test, which referred to us trying to culture the virus. Now, that one doesn't just look for presence of the virus, mm -hmm. but to see whether the virus can multiply and grow. That's the test that showed us that in the first 10 days that someone gets the, the test the, positive, the, yeah. even if they are symptomatic, they can sp spread and infect. Mm -hmm. But after 10 days, their infection, ability to infect virtually is non-existent. Okay. So it was based on this finding that WHO said that, wait a minute, if you are keeping someone for three, four, five months waiting for a negative test, you might be there for, for a year. Mm -hmm. And so the fellow is good to go because one, they cannot feel, they cannot get sick when they've been well for 10 days. Okay. If you'll be sick, it should happen in the first 10 days. And then secondly, they cannot infect others. But that's not absolute. No, you see, people say it's not absolute. In science, we say never say never. Mm -hmm. Even the first one, the studies that showed us that we should do two negative tests, it was not absolute. When mm -hmm. we say absolute, you don't appear to be overly There's sure no in science. Yeah. Because tomorrow's studies would nullify what you know today. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying, that you work with what you have, the evidence. That's okay. how they call it. So, and, and, and that's why WHO, even when you look at WHO's guidelines, it uses the word interim. Mm -hmm. Because in the face of new evidence, it will change. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, don't be too rigid when you are engaging in behavior that is guided by scientific knowledge. Because okay. we are wearing the mask today. Studies can come out tomorrow and say that your risk of getting is 10 times when you wear the when mask. Wear the mask yeah. Don't be surprised we take off the mask. Mm -hmm. So really, and it's a, new, it's a new germ we are trying to study. So you must be, in the beginning, I tell people, once you come alone, be ready to be flexible. Okay. And, and we, we didn't give these guidelines because as a nation, we are trying to find a, a quick way out. Remember. So it wasn't about easing the pressure no, on... No, we'll come to the easy. You know the U.S., Mm -hmm. just adopted this WHO recommendation about a week or so ago. Where now, they don't do two weeks. Mm. Ten days after first recording a symptom. Yeah. In fact, we are even doing two weeks okay. of asymptomatic and three, four days of being asymptomatic. They do ten days, good to go. Mm -hmm. There is no way they will let people go and infect others. But the science is, supports your position. The first ten days can be, you can contaminate, you can, you can infect others. And so, um, again, what I'm happy about once someone falls within the category, that makes us test them. Yeah. There are two things involved. Those in this category either might have come across someone who is positive mm -hmm. or having some symptoms. That shows that it might be COVID. 
immediately you fall in the category, there, there's one thing we advise you on, mm. what, which is what? Uh, uh, quarantine. In yeah. fact, quarantine if you've not been confirmed. confirmed. Or let's say, oh, in English word, the English is what? Isolation. Yeah. So, really, if even samples keep two, three weeks, mm -hmm. the advice we give those who samples we've taken is that Just keep, isolate. stay out, isolate for two weeks. So that even if the results delays for three weeks, after two weeks, based on our criteria, you once you're asymptomatic, you are good to go. But we don't have any app to track these people and ensure that they are actually oh, isolating themselves. So how yeah. do we know that yeah. we are not worsening the community spread? Yeah. Because you take my sample and I have to wait two weeks yeah. or three weeks. You ask me to isolate and maybe I have yeah. work to do. So as a state or as a physician, you don't have the power, everything, you don't have the 100% control. You need some cooperation and support from the other party. Okay. I mean the client or the citizen. So we should be real. There's no country that can have everybody under lock and key. Mm -hmm. So what we do is to try to, you try to disseminate the information in a language that can best be understood. Okay. And then secondly, we do this for tuberculosis. Mm. What is referred to as a directly observed treatment dot, where you give the medicine directly to the person, either you the health worker yeah. or a relative. Okay. So HIV and TB, if you don't produce a relative, we don't give you the drugs. Okay. That person will be the check or support for us. Okay. The same thing applies for COVID. So you make sure that you sell two messages to the person. The first one is that they can get very ill. Mm -hmm. So they must isolate themselves and be on the watch out for symptoms that they report to us quickly. Okay. That alone creates some platform for the person to know that things can be bad. So better take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Forgive me, but let me use the word anxiety. Some such a person would hardly contemplate deliberately going to infect others when they know they themselves can perish. That's the first one. Okay. The second one also is that because we are human beings, we don't want those we love to fall ill. And by the way, when we say those we love, those you know keep you happy yeah. in this world. Yeah. So you yourself do these things so that they don't also get into trouble. These are the two things that you bank your hopes on. And um, I know there are a few apps that helps us to know where the person where is the going, person their phone is. number and all that. Okay, like the app that was launched by... Yes, the yeah? communication and, uh, minister. And the com yes. What, what happened to that? Oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's still in use, but as I sit here, honestly, I can't tell okay. the scope of the monitor that is covered by that app. But it's still active oh. because we don't hear people talk about it. Yeah, because um, really... We'll come to that. If you look at the way some people have behaved towards COVID cases, you know, where we encourage people to go and test, and immediately go like, oh, Bella tested. What's the result? I want to know. Mm. I tell people that the way we behave will determine how those who are positive also behave. If they are positive and they have the app, how can they tell us when we are in a hurry to try and crucify them? Mm. Nowhere in the world do they push people to come and say, I am positive. Okay. You encourage them to come out voluntarily as ambassadors. And that Gary Smith mm -hmm, did that. Mm -hmm. A few people did that. Yeah. That is, uh, Kennedy Jamal recently came also on came out and said uh, yes. The, the more you get those things, the, the more we embrace the condition. And then those with the apps will be comfortable now to tell you. Okay. Exactly. I see. But I mean, the app protects you. And that's what the Ministry of Communication said, yeah. that it will protect your identity. So yeah. even if you enter the details and eventually... No, no, you, you, asked about, you asked about... Why don't we? Why hear? don't we? Exactly. And if the person is having it and is even benefiting, if they don't share their story with you, how would they? How would you even know that they've been put on such an app which is being monitored? But we Look, want to know how many people have logged onto the app. How many people well, have entered the details? Have, we don't have, have that. I don't have okay. the numbers. In okay. fact, like I started by saying, as I sit here, I I know that we sell these protocols, these messages mm -hmm. to these people, and be, like I said, based on these two there is the high chance of compliance yeah. because of these two. Because these two are very, very severe conditions. Okay. That you can fall ill and might lose your life. You don't want to, you are not even in a good frame of mind to be contemplating deliberately going to affect others. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, like I said, is that you know that your loved ones can fall ill, even if you are asymptomatic. They can, and we share this message with them. Mm -hmm. That's why the, the elderly and yeah. those with symptoms. And we are human beings. Mortality for COVID is 0 0.5. Mm -hmm. Now, what it means is that in Ghana, for every 1,000 cases, you might lose five people. Mm. If you look at the statistics, you go like, oh, this is not bad. Not, yeah. But if your mother or your auntie or a very special friend falls in this five group, 
in your house, it will be it will not be five percent, it will be hundred percent. Yeah. So we we sell this message that look, you never know who around you is going to be part of this five. And okay. even if you are safe, think of the one you might harm who is dear to you. And I think largely people like this gentleman who called me when I was on my way here, a gentleman called me. Uh -huh. He's been in isolation for three weeks. Okay. He called me and went like, Doc, my test is at Noguchi. Uh, what is that? I said, okay, we'll speak to them and see what is happening. And I was like, ah, but have you been asking to for two weeks? He said, yes. Then come out. He said, well, Doc, I'm okay, but I'm trying to, you know, mm. uh, and all that. So you, could, you can see that even going, even after being asymptomatic for two weeks, this guy is still in, in isolation. Yeah. Meaning the message has gone down that you got to take care of yourself and keep your family safe. Let, let's talk about the test kits, uh, the rap, rapid diagnostic test kits yeah. that were forwarded to the FDA. We've yeah. been waiting for weeks, and I'm getting information here um, that says that FDA says that they did not meet the requirements, and there were two requirements, specificity and sensitivity. Yeah. Uh, your doctor, I'm sure you can speak yeah. to yeah. these yeah. issues. Yeah. What does it necessarily mean, and why has it taken so long for All us right. to get this information? Yeah, so when we say specificity... Um, you see, you can develop a particular tool as, um, let's say, for COVID. Uh -huh. So there can be an ingredient which is supposed to pick a particular protein. You can have a tool that picks it quickly. So we say it's very sensitive. Picks uh -huh. it means that it will pick it and tell us that, okay, the thing is positive. Okay. But the protein has, that it has picked can be a signal or an indicator for three conditions. Uh -huh. Remember, coronavirus, there are different types of corona. Coronavirus, there's one that causes Middle East respiratory syndrome, uh -huh. MERS. Uh -huh. SARS uh -huh. is a form of coronavirus. Okay. So it can pick it, but maybe it's not specific to novel virus. Okay. So although it quickly picks it a positive it. test, it can show you the wrong condition. Okay. But when we say it has high specificity, what it means is that once it tells you this is a positive test, absolutely it okay. is COVID. Okay. If it's very specific for COVID. But it might be low in sensitivity. What it means is that you can give it, you can use it for 10 confirmed COVID cases and it will pick only one. Mm. It means its sensitivity is low. But once it picks, it cannot be malaria. Okay. I hope you get me. And okay. these things are established by working with patients who are being managed now as COVID cases. Mm. So the rapid test that the Mimi spoke about, FDA, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's based on studies that Professor Ampofo the case management team have have done using the kits that people have produced. And one thing I'll say, just a general rule is that mm -hmm. from what I picked from them, from Sam Popo and his team, yeah. you had let's say let's say 50 confirmed cases of COVID who are severely ill, mm -hmm. being managed at let's say UGMC. They take their samples and use these uh, kits yeah. to test them. And the kits say that let's say for, uh, out of the 50, about 20 are positive. The rest, the rest negative. Are negative. Meanwhile, it's been tested. And, and, and these are not asymptomatic. Meanwhile, these are people who are severely ill, some in critical condition, okay. having serious dosage of the virus, what we refer to as the viral load. Mm -hmm. It means they have a high count per sample. And the kit tells us that they, they are negative. So what then that means is that if you use it for the population, you might lose yeah. okay. some positive cases. So uh, I think as a general rule, I'll tell people that it's not like we are in a hurry to discount these ones. Okay. I always believe that there can be opportunities for you to use them. Look, let me give you an example. Okay. The 1,050 mandatory quarantine people we had when we locked our bodies, Bella, uh -huh. not even one of them had temperature, as in mm. fever. Mm. All had nice normal temperature. Yeah. But when we tested them, we picked close to 90, 90 or so cases who were positive for COVID. Uh -huh. What it means is that the thermometer gun, although it's looking for temperature, might, might not be too sensitive to COVID. It means that a lot of people who are uh, having COVID, having COVID can pass not, through. Yeah. So an antibody test, a rapid kit, even if it has a 40% threshold, would be of greater value than the thermometer gun at, let's say, the airport. Okay, I'll let you hold on with this one. We'll come to the issue of thermometer guns because at a lot of workplaces and a lot of you know, public places, we're using thermometer guns to check people's temperature. And if you really cannot detect if you have COVID-19 or not, 
Is it really important that we use them? Dr. Okoboy, Deputy Minister of Health, is our guest on COVID-19. Keep your questions coming in at TV3 Ghana and we'll read them when we get back. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360 and we're privileged to have the Deputy Minister of Health, Dr. Okoboy, join us this morning. We've been talking about Ghana's case management so far and we just uh, started talking about the use of thermometer guns and its inability to pick all uh, COVID-19 cases. And so the question would be that if that's the case, why are we still using thermometer guns at various workplaces and public places before allowing entry? Yeah, so it's very simple. It's like malaria. Mm. You have children who come, the only thing is that they can't eat well. They check their temperature all the time. Temperature is okay. Mm -hmm. You do and do the lab test. Five plus, three, four pluses of malaria. Yeah. And they, they can't eat well because their blood level is gone down. And some, immediately you have to go and admit and put blood on. Mm -hmm. Yet they came, no temperature. So the point is that if you get 10 people being picked by the gun as having temperature, it's possible three, four can be COVID. Yeah. And so it also has its purpose. The only thing is that once you are not having temperature, the risk of being COVID is low. Oh, okay. But it doesn't mean it's zero. Mm -hmm. So it's always about risk levels. You know, and uh, like we're um, okay. talking about yeah. offset. Usually, people are categorized or put into risk groups. Mm -hmm. Now, when someone has one, two, three, four risk, then their chance of being positive for COVID high. mounts or mm -hmm. goes up. So, number one, when someone has temperature, two, they are coughing, and three, they tell you occasionally they struggle to breathe. Yeah. This is a classical case definition for COVID. Okay. So, if you have 100 of such people, don't be surprised if 60 come out of COVID positive. Mm. But when you have 100 people with um, no temperature, you might pick two or three cases of COVID. Mm -hmm. So you realize that the risk is lower based on the number of cases you picked. Okay. For the, those coughing and with temperature, about 60, 70 can be COVID. Andy. Okay. But, you know, so it has its purpose. You don't take it out because that one case that it will pick based on the temperature is what might do the magic for you as a health manager. Let's talk about the cure for COVID-19. We still have not found a cure, even though yeah. it's been purported by some doctor in Texas that hydroxy uh, chloroquine could be yeah. the cure. Yesterday, the Ghana Health Service did um, you know, say that they were using hydroxychloroquine yeah. and Zithromax, I believe, to treat patients. So yesterday, Dr. Bertha also says that it's not really true because even though Ghana is using some of these drugs, there's really no uh, scientific evidence to prove because we're waiting for more details. What do you make of that doctor's assertion that the cure for COVID-19 is hydroxychloroquine, even though you know, across board, we've been told that that is not the drug. You know, so, first of all, uh, some people sent me the video, mm -hmm. and this is the response I sent. So, let me read, read it. Okay. one or two. I said she must be commended for speaking out on her experience. Mm. Only that a medical practice, a practice that is claimed to be therapeutic, that is, can treat or have solution, mm. must work not only in one place, but universally. Okay. If it works at a particular place or places only due to special factors, an approval can be given at those jurisdictions to allow use until the evidence becomes replicable in mm. other jurisdictions. Okay. And of significant efficacy and efficiency. Now, this is what it means. If I give you some concoction in only TV3, mm -hmm. and for some reason, anytime I give it to your workers, they get well. Yeah. But they send it to multimedia, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. They send it to other people, it doesn't work. Really, I can be given permission to use it only at um, TV3, TV3 because it is possible that something that you guys eat here or do here makes it work. Okay. But if I want to hold it out as a solution for that problem I treat you with, it must work in other jurisdictions. That's what we refer to as clinical trials and all those mm -hmm. things. Now, let me say straight away that when COVID emerged, because it's a new disease, mm -hmm. people are allowed, that's what happens, to try one or a few th drugs yeah. based on some initial experience. Chloroquine happened to be one of the drugs that they tried to um, shoot or to uh, put on people who were positive. Yeah. Now, 
Once they started doing so, what medicine allows is to follow and do some studies uh -huh. to tell the outcome of the use because it was not originally meant to be used for that okay. or it's not been proven to work on that. Work. But you are allowed to try because there is nothing anyway. Uh -huh. Like it's a new disease. So try it. Now, when you try for some time, then we start to look at the benefits versus the adverse effects. Uh -huh. Immediately over a period, you realize immediately that the adverse effects or the negatives are overwhelming the positives. Those who started can be advised to hold on or okay. put a stop. Okay. In fact, when there's overwhelming evidence that is causing harm, I'm not talking about just adverse effects. There's a difference. Okay. Adverse effects means that some maybe discomforting side effects. Side effects yeah. But harm means that maybe there is proof that is used in, let's say, 10 patients. Mm -hmm. And it, we can track the drug okay. to the death of the patient in, let's say, four people or half. Mm -hmm. Quickly, then you must pull it out. Because okay. the do harm no principle applies in medicine that if you come and you don't add anything, don't come and worsen it okay. as a drug. Mm. So before a drug is approved, it might cause some few discomfort, but the benefits must be more. But if your benefits is not that much, and we can prove that you are causing real harm, mm -hmm. it must be pulled out. So, as we speak, I'll make it simple. In yeah. Ghana, mm -hmm. in the cocktail of medicines which have been approved for emergency use, mm -hmm. I have to check. I don't know whether yesterday night was stopped, but I think we've not come out to say the adrenochloroquine is cancelled. Mm -hmm. I'm being. How uh, long have we been using no, it coming, from the I'm beginning? Of from the time that it was tried in certain jurisdictions it was more or less approved as being in the cocktail i'm using my words well when we say cocktail this is what happens a doctor at kolibu yeah knows that zinc of it which is um um sorry i said zinc of it um zitromax uh -huh. which has is an antibiotic zinc uh -huh. hydroxychloroquine even steroids you heard of corticosteroids like um, dexamethasone okay. it's a steroid so you have this cocktail of medicines which are allowed in the management okay. You can have a doctor who normally is comfortable has been using first two, yeah. zinc and azithromycin, and has seen results with it uh -huh. with less complications. Okay. The doctor can be using a regimen which might not necessarily be right. the same regimen in Tamale. Okay. So the point is that once the drug is in what is allowed, it can be applied in managing the patient. Mm. So as we speak, I don't want to speak for the case management team, but it is possible that although it's in the books, its usage might not be that significant. Okay, because exactly. we don't have the final results of uh, what it can... No, no, because do. of the reports we are getting. Okay. Because those who used it, for which reason we are allowed to approve it for emergency use, are the same same results that it's we are not, not... working. Exactly. What are the adverse effects? Because um, we know that the late Dr. Plange, yeah. is, uh, you know, unfortunately died, but they said he also was treated with hydroxychloroquine. No, so, so usually in medicine... Um, for the programs like this, you don't want to cite. Okay, I apologize. I mean, yes, especially yes, for yes, his family yes, who may yes, not be too yes, happy with the yes, measure of the name. I apologize. So, yes, yes. But so, then, what yeah. are the adverse effects? So, so I mean, usually, um, I'll go. I'll speak in generic terms. It means I'll not refer necessarily to adverse to anybody. Okay. Yeah. So let's say you have a drug like. <clears throat> let me take a very simple drug. Let's say amoxicillin. Mm -hmm. People get let's say a boil. They are put on. Fluclox or amoxicillin, mm -hmm. and they get better. Yeah. Now, if you are using amoxicillin in someone who's gotten a boil, they are, the, the, the state of their body is such that it will respond to the amoxicillin and then they will recover they from recover. the boil. Yeah. But if you have someone who is gasping for breath because they've taken a particular concoction, uh -huh. and someone tells you that, oh, the last time someone took this concoction, I gave amoxicillin, yeah. it has not been proven as a cure for the solution that okay. poison yeah but you are throwing it to see what happens if in 10 people you throw it at them and you lose all of them in another 10 you don't throw it at all mm -hmm. and they all survive or majority survive it is possible that you rather adding them easily want to complicate matters because okay. all your 10 died mm. the point i want to make is that chloroquine has its generic side effects which in usage in treating let's say malaria and all that yeah which might not be too overwhelming. Which, what are these side effects? Oh, oh I mean... It varies with each individual. Exactly. Okay. And I don't want to go into specifics. Okay. But the point is that side effects which are maybe tolerable in managing what it was meant for mm -hmm. can be severe, especially when you are trying it for another condition. That's why okay. I use amoxicillin. Yeah. We have what we use it for, where you know that it will work largely. 
maybe a few nausea and things. But when you go and use it in another condition, where you are now trying to see whether it fits, yeah. the side effects you are seeing might not necessarily be its side effects that it came when it was approved. Mm -hmm. Because you are using it in another condition. Look, in Malaria, what is happening in Malaria? In Malaria, you have parasites which have been introduced in your, um, your bloodstream. Uh, your bloodstream. You have okay. the plasmodium, uh, um, how do you call it? Uh, the parasite. Okay. It eats food in your cells. When it is satisfied, the cells will be broken. Then it produces more children. It will keep on breaking your cells. The poisons it's releasing makes you feel weak and mm -hmm. sick. Your blood level is also going down. That's what is happening in malaria. When someone has malaria. In, when someone has COVID, mm -hmm. the fellow has been, there's a germ that has entered the chest. And the whole body has mounted an immune response. More blood is flowing to their chest. Yeah. The blood is coming out of the vessel, the fluid, mm -hmm. and filling their chest. Two different mechanisms happening. Yeah. You throw the same drug. In malaria, it was going to target a parasite, which is eating one cell, breaking it, and going to another one. Mm -hmm. In this, you have the whole body. In malaria, there's nothing like an immune response. You've introduced a drug, which yeah. is going around, targeting the plasmodium and killing them. Okay. This one, the, the body already has mounted a response. So all kinds of changes have happened, and you've brought in cloaking. Mm. I'm saying this so that we appreciate the fact that the side effects you might see in management of a COVID case might not be necessarily the established side effects for chloroquine when it was developed for malaria. Okay. But point is simple. It is part of the drugs that were approved for emergency use because we're all studying the virus. Mm. But as we speak, based on the experience of our doctors in Ghana, they might use it normal, underuse it, or overuse oh, it. Yes. It will depend on your experience. Okay. Anita is on standby for messages. We'll be speaking about the easing of restrictions in public transport and what that means based on what Dr. Bertha said about the likelihood of you still contracting the virus even if you have a nose mask once you are not adhering to the one meter um, rule. And also we'll talk about students and what the plan is uh, for these final year students after they are done with their exams. Are we going to test them before they go home? I hope we'll have enough time for that. But let's go to Anita so she can read some of your messages. So this one says, good morning, Bella. The deputy minister is talking and bringing out the facts. In fact, he is an experienced doctor, and I love his explanation. That is coming from Baby in Accra. All right, good morning. Uh, this is coming from John in Hohoi. Please ask Dr. Bernard if paracetamol and cough mixture is enough for treatment of suspected COVID-19 because that is what they gave me for the past two weeks and my result is not ready. I'm at home, but I'm still having dry throat. And can I go to work now? And he's also asking uh, what has been done for healthcare workers across the country who tested positive for COVID-19. Let me take a second message and then uh, he will address that. Good morning, Bella and Anita. Please ask uh, Dr. Okobo the plans put in place by government to bring back Ghanaians that want to return to the country but don't have money to pay for hotel bills. Also, how can they register for the voter's ID card? And that is coming from Paulina in Pando. I guess he can address these questions and then we move on to the rest. Yeah, so, has to, yeah, so if maybe someone who works in your office tested positive for mm. and later you come and say, oh, apart from cough, I'm, I'm cool, or maybe yeah. some temperature. If your situation, they check your oxygen and it's fine, saturation, they can give you some paracetamol to handle the temperature oh, no. okay. and maybe visit you at home. So really, it depends also on your state. But if it gets, it's not that good, usually yeah, you'll be yeah, asked yeah. to come into a treatment okay. center. Now, after two weeks of being asymptomatic uh -huh. or from the day you started having a cough, if you count and it's two weeks from the day you start having a cough and the last three, four days, the cough oh, hasn't wow. been bad on your well, yeah. really, you would have qualified for the recovery or the... Um, the definition. Okay. What I always advise is that go back to a doctor for the doctor to certify that you are fit to work. Before you do. Because we are not doing necessarily do the second test. That's the advice that we give. Because a doctor can certify and say, okay, you are fit for work. Mm -hmm. You know what? You can have someone who has tested negative for COVID, but gets tired easily. Mm -hmm. They might be negative, but, but they are they, they, not fit for work. So being mm -hmm. fit for work is a, is, 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 a, is a category that must be determined or certified by the right. medical practitioner. Okay. So that is also very important. And then health workers. We have a life insurance on health workers for, um, what's the word? For death and for, um, we have a word we use, where you lose some function of your body because of the COVID. There is an insurance that you have to receive. Mm. And we've told all the unions and the workers to produce, if there's any person, produce the paperwork, okay. the confirmation, and 
we'll see how to support. Okay. I, I wish we could touch more on it. Anita, hold on. Let me quickly ask about, um, you know, the buses, because our time is almost up. We'll read yeah. the messages shortly. But the fact that the second uh, phase of restrictions that were eased uh, included the fact that the president says we should yeah. not, we should revert to our old system yeah. of packing buses yeah. to capacity. Yeah. Yes, the churches are supposed to yeah. still adhere to the one meter rule. Yeah. And the question is, if I'm not socially distancing myself in a bus, yes, I go to church, I can still pass on the virus, I can still catch the virus. Dr. Yeah. Bethel yesterday said that if you have the nose mask, it doesn't necessarily mean that you may not catch yeah, the virus, true. especially when you're close to the person. Yeah. So what's the science and data behind the restrictions yeah. and the easing of these restrictions? Yeah, then? so let me quickly say that we know the theory, what is on paper, that when you do, your risk for COVID comes close to zero. Mm. I said close to zero because there is nothing yeah, you no. can do mm. that will make you zero risk. Okay. First of all, we know that when you stay in your bedroom and don't get exposed to people and surfaces and objects, your risk is low. It's low, okay. But when you are dealing with a disease, that doesn't require only tablet or medicine for two, three days, mm -hmm. but requires restrictions on other activities and requires change in behavior, you immediately realize that those restrictions can now start to pose other risk. Okay. So then on the table, after some time, you don't only have the theory on that particular disease, but the other risk it is producing because of its management. What are these other risks? So if all of TV3 had stayed in their bedroom this morning, there will be a blackout. Mm -hmm. All media men in their bedroom. If you have the Mokola market on fire, it will burn to the end and kill everybody. Because mm. nobody can call and alert the police that go there. The police will make a call. Remember, those in the telephony sector go to work to keep... That's how we call them essential workers. Okay. So the point I'm making is that the truck truck driver, if over time they have capacity, mm -hmm. makes it impossible to retrieve the cost of operation, they will fold out, go home. Mm -hmm. When they go home, now their ch social impact, their children cannot afford medicines if they are sick. Okay. Secondly, you have a situation where, in fact, there will be disruptions in the family. So this is the point. It is a fact, based on the books, that when we keep a distance and wear masks, our risk is lower. But if we find ourselves in a condition mm -hmm. where we must be close to each other, then we make sure that we apply those measures that are still within our control, like the mask. Okay. And ventilation is absolutely crucial. If you are in a trotro and the windows are open, if someone has a mask, the chance of their particles escaping is very low. Mm. But assuming even one particle comes out, its chance of being recirculated re is low when the windows are open. Okay. So the science is that when you are in an enclosed space, enclosed space, you are quite a lot. The distance is closer. Uh -huh. That is an incubation chamber for spreading for spread. the virus. But you talked about the economy of yes. the people. The president did say that yes. we know how to bring the economy back, yes. but not lives. Yes. So yes. is that also a reason why he made that statement? But, and are we practicing herd immunity no, in that case? No, no, no. As for herd immunity, I tell people, he said, no, no. When we okay. say herd immunity, immunity, what it means is that we want well, almost everybody to, to get it, it quickly. Yeah. If we're practicing herd immunity, I would be speaking with a mask. Okay. Because I want you to get it quickly so you recover. Okay. So as for that, it's no, no. So, but, but the point is that, like I said, when you're a health manager, if it's a disease that requires only medicine, you don't have a problem. But if it's a disease that requires you that you stop all cars on the road, mm -hmm. the next question, you know what? In the U.S., they had a study. Yeah. Out of hospital death, the number of bodies that are brought dead already, increased six times mm. during their lockdown. What it means is that when there is an emergency, because you've told the people to stay home, something that they would have presented quickly, they are considering their options. Mm. Secondly, in Ghana here, the pregnant woman who goes into labor or suddenly starts bleeding, mm -hmm. they have to call the taxi. Yeah. If most taxi drivers have been told to stay at home, they, she, will, she, will, she will spend one hour to get a vehicle. When in normal times, it's been two. So my point is simple. In the midst of many protocols, mm -hmm. your risk is significantly what, reduced. Yeah. So if you keep the distance, you wear the mask, you don't talk plenty, you don't sing, you wash your hands, mm. you further what, reduce your risk. So you are encouraged. Uh, in the draw, the mm -hmm. person is wearing the mask. So that has helped you reduce your risk. Yeah. Because of the distance, of course, that is a sort of, your risk is, of course, on the higher side mm. than if they are near distance. But because you know that one, we don't encourage singing and things. In the church, people, the church, 
we sing, we do all those things. The distance is okay. But remember... But if it's an open space and I'm still singing and all that, it could be trapped or then it's less likely to even... Yeah, so uh, it's all about person. risk. In an open space where you are singing the, and without mask, the chance is higher because you have particles still with the windows open than the place where there is a mask. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about addition of what? The protocols. In a church where they are keeping distance, they are singing, right? So have we reverted to allowing them to sing? Because when the president spoke, he said we will not have... No, no, I mean, as much the... as possible. You see, you don't micromanage. You see, you give people the principle. Okay. The principle is that when you sing without a mask, you have mm. particles in the air. Your brother can inhale. Okay. So, so, so that, and, and Bella, I think this is also important. You know what? Formite, any surface that a virus can stay on, is referred to as a formite. I'm here. We've kept a distance. Uh -huh. I'm wearing my mask. But I've touched <laughs> this microphone. Mm. If it has the virus, I have it in my hand. Immediately I get an itch and scratch, I can pick the virus. Mm. So now that tells you that even if I come close or I touch anything or we touch each other, once I wash my hands or sanitize, especially before taking it to my face, I have further out, reduce my risk. Okay. So you want to combine a lot of the protocols as much as possible. If you find a gap, gap as in one protocol is gone. It doesn't mean the fellow now will get the disease, mm. but as much as possible, you want to keep more protocols than necessary. You pile yeah, the you protocols. Pile. Just How does a drunk person socially distance then? Because they are intoxicated at that point. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, nothing is absolute. Okay. We've said that it should be open air. Okay. Of course, you can't drink <laughs> with your mask on. So, if you take your mask, you've drunk something, mm. and because of it, you are getting closer. Mm. I mean, like I said, if it had been in a closed room, the risk is even greater because all the particles are trapped. Okay. Let, let's read messages and I'll ask my last question about students and what our plan is for them before they go. I hope that they'll give us some time anyway. Anita, sorry for keeping you waiting. This one says, I am an S and I know how ineffective the thermometer gun is. So I'm glad he touched on the fact that it wouldn't be able to detect some cases. My only worry is that why are we allowing it's used at almost every place during this time or is it because its result is fast that is coming from francis in hope good morning bella i am currently in mandatory quarantine my samples were taken on the 25th of july when should i expect my result mm. okay good morning bella uh, in fact the deputy minister is talking scientifically i am very happy we have such people in ghana and that is coming from barrett from accra okay uh this one says um, good morning, uh, Dr. Bernard, Bella, and Anita. I congratulate Dr. Bernard and his people for their hard work in fighting COVID-19. But I have an issue with the attitude of we Ghanaians towards this pandemic. People do, do not know the essence of wearing face masks and other safety protocols. Please, I want to take this opportunity to tell Ghanaians to do their part in the fight so we can win together. Okay, let me go up here. Um, this was a good morning to you, Dr. Uh, Bernard, I want to find out whether universities are allowed to let the level 200 and 300 go to campus to write their semester exams after the final year students are done. I meant the sandwich students. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Dr. Kobo is doing very well with his public education on the pandemic. Please, Doc, speak up more and forcefully. Hi, uh, Bella and Anita. You ladies are doing well so far as COVID-19 is concerned. Stay blessed. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, please, this show is really educative. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. Will anybody with comorbidity ultimately die from coronavirus when contracted? In other words, the fact that some people have hypertension means they will definitely die from the disease. That is coming from Eric in Hoa, and I guess it's a question. Mm. Okay, uh, let me just... Okay. Let's... Finally, there's one on the trotters. Let me take this one. This one says, Good morning, Belen and Anita. I humbly appeal to our dear president to reconsider commercial vehicles having to take full passengers. Uh, in practice, indeed, it is extremely difficult to distance oneself, especially in trotters. I therefore respectfully appeal to our president, who has done enough to demonstrate enough, uh, you know, to exhibit his love, dedication, and loyalty to Ghana as a country and the wonderful effort he has put in to, uh, to contain COVID-19. Okay. All right. Doc, quick one before we go. Our time is up. What's the plan for these students who are allowed to go back to school to write their final exams? The question is, uh, we all don't know if they may have contracted the virus along the line or not. Are we going to test them before they go home? No, no, no but, but the risk, if they are asymptomatic, they are fine. Mm -hmm. And he said because they went to school, they should be tested. What about you in the community? Okay. <laughs> because they came from the community before going there. The point I want to make is that, assume anywhere you find yourself, that the next person might be positive and that they've not completed the 10 or 14 days. So you've got to wear your mask mm -hmm. and you've got to sanitize when you come close so that you don't get it should they have it. Yeah. That's the thought. 
we should not see them like people with elevated risk. When I say elevated risk, like, forgive me, but anybody who f flies into the country because the virus rates are high over there, mm -hmm. that person comes from an elevated risk environment. Okay. But for these kids, their schools are within our jurisdiction. They came from us to school. And when they are coming back to us, unless they have symptoms, I don't see why anybody go. go. Look. They came from us to school, but they came from different you know what? communities. Yeah, I'm coming. You know what? The kids, the, the cases we've recorded, the last time I checked, let's say maybe 100 or so. When you divide, and most of them, by the way, by the grace of God, have recovered. Mm. When you divide by the total number of kids we had in SHS, close to 600,000, the rate is almost negligible. Mm -hmm. You know what? When they test someone who is positive, sorry, they test someone and they are positive at Makola Market, yeah. it doesn't mean an agbogulushi. It's There's no case. You only pick because you tested. Mm -hmm. So the kids came from our environment. They were tested at school and were positive. You are at home saying, that don't come near me. Test mm -hmm. before. It's because they've not tested you. Okay. Because it's possible that you two might... But if I'm older and I have other, you know, um, cool. illnesses, then maybe I could... No, that's why all of us, you assume that the next person has it. Okay. So that whether you are old or young, just make sure. And the one who has about comorbidities. Mm -hmm. I know people who are hypertensive, diabetic, had COVID, and by the grace of God, were eventually asymptomatic. Okay. It's not automatic that if you have high blood pressure and diabetes, you are going to die of COVID. But okay. what is important is that if you have any of these conditions, they must be in controllable limits. Okay. So if you are hypertensive and your pressure, you don't take medicines. You know, but yeah. you start taking your medicine and your pressure is on the roof. If COVID comes in, it can get complicated. Okay. Okay. This is all time will allow. I, I wish we could have asked a few more questions. Someone wanted to know what government's plan is for the prisons and how we're ensuring that there's no spread. Maybe another time we'll try and get Dr. Koboy, maybe on phone or whatever. But thank you so much for Thanks. availing yourself. Um, you everybody, know, everybody. Some, some of these questions. And um, to you watching as well, thank you for tuning in. Uh, Kweku says the minister is circumspective and very transparent with his explanations. And that's it for COVID-19 360. We'll be back tomorrow. Today we've been speaking to Dr. Okoboy, who's the Deputy Minister of Health. He's given us insight uh, to the disease and what we can do. And he's also the MP for Lejo Kuku. Let's see if he's going to retain his seat come December 7th. But anyway, thank you very much. And thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.